Hey, <clears throat> whoops, let's, uh, this one's not gonna work. Okay, let's try this again, stop. Hey students, this is uh, Professor Selby again, back with a little more political science fun time for your learning enjoyment. Um, we can at least pretend it's fun, right? Okay, uh, this is our second lecture in the American President series, second and last lecture. This lecture is going to cover the president's power over the federal bureaucracy, um, specifically the power of executive order, okay? We're also going to look, so remember my first video covered the beginning of this, we're also going to look at executive, uh, excuse me, emergency powers, which are linked strongly to executive orders, um, and uh, some interesting debates about uh, emergency powers. Um, uh, interestingly, so executive orders are, um, they're part of the chief executive role, um, but it's not explicitly stated in the Constitution uh, that the president gets to do this, but it's considered an implied right or implied power because what, what, what's happening? What does it mean? Well, <clears throat> if he's not allowed to tell the bureaucracy how to do their business, then what's the point of being a chief executive, right? So you're the boss, you get to tell people what to do. Like there's limits, he's not allowed to, as I'll show you, he's not allowed to violate the constitution in most cases, he's not allowed to violate standing law in most cases. Um, but, um, you know, uh, there's some exceptions here as well. Um, so, you know, the president gets to hire and fire uh, department heads, right? Like his cabinet, like that's his job. He needs to have his people there, at least to a certain extent. Um, uh, uh, within the realm of people who work for the federal government, that's the federal bureaucracy only, the president has the power to decide how they are going to go about doing their business. Executive orders are not laws, but they have the force of law. Okay, they're not allowed to go against either statutory or constitutional law. They are reviewed by the by the courts. They start in the lower of courts, of course, um, if the court wants to. So if, any, if there's any questions, it goes to the court like it always does. Um, and interestingly, right, this again brings us back to the notion of kingship and the way the American presidency is modeled off of British kingship. And in this case, it's not just British, it's kind of more general kingship. The king's power to decree laws. So the king had a certain amount of power to just decree that certain things are going to happen. Pic picture some like fantasy movie, the town crier. Hear ye, hear ye. The king has, the king hereby decrees, and then they read some decree, right? Um, now, again, here the power of decree is much more constrained than how uh, kings at least wanted to use it. Um, so in Britain, the king couldn't really make laws without consent of the people, but in France, he could. So keep that in mind. Um, uh, so in a democratic republic, the power of decree is much constrained because the legislature is supposed to be the first and most dominant branch of government. Uh, so what is the federal bureaucracy? The federal bureaucracy is everyone and anyone who works for the federal government. There's 15 departments and a whole bunch of commissions, okay? Departments are Department of Treasury, uh, State Department, um, Department of Education, okay? Uh, the president has pretty much direct control over the functioning of the various departments. Commissions are a little bit different. They're insulated from the president's power to hire and fire, such as the Federal Reserve. And we did that exactly because we wanted to, much like for the Supreme Court, we wanted to have experts there who uh, were making decisions based upon their expertise, their technical expertise, not based upon political pressure or public opinion, right? So the Federal Reserve is supposed to make decisions based on the criteria of their knowledge of economics and uh, what economic science tells them about the best way to deal with a problem. Should we raise or lower interest rates, right? 
Um, there's about half dozen, few more commissions maybe. Um, it's sort of here you have again one of my wonderful drawings, okay? But here's 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 what it looks like, right? Underneath the president is the federal bureaucracy. That's why he's wearing a shirt with a P on it, because he's the president and he's happy because it's awesome. And uh, uh, there's departments, like I said, and commissions. And he gets to tell people how to do their job. Executive orders are not laws, but they do have the force of law. OK, so if the president says do your job this way. He's, he has the legal right to do that, and you have to do your job that way. Now, he starts to get some leeway here. It sounds all simple and fun. Let's take a few easy examples and then build up to some more complicated ones. Uh, so Barack Obama decided to raise the minimum wage for all federal workers. So you're a janitor or something like that. You're working for the federal government. All right, you just got a pay bump. Pay bump. That's cool, right? He's the boss. He gets to do that, right? It's good to be king. Um, but again, this applies only to people working for the federal government, okay? Uh, Executive Order 9981, excuse me, desegregated the military. This is right after World War II. This was maybe, you could even think of this as kind of the first victory in what became the civil rights movement. So it was 1946, I think, if memory served. It might have been 45. Um, but I mean, huge, the military had been segregated since the introduction of black troops late in the civil war. There's a pretty good movie called glory, um, about it. It's really not bad. Um, and Truman's the boss. He gets to do that. He's like, look, a bunch of African Americans just went and fought and died to protect democracy worldwide. And at home, they don't even get equal treatment and not even in the military where they gave their lives, of course they're deserving of uh, equal treatment in the military, right? And in addition to just having segregated units, black units were put on more work duty, you know, they weren't allowed to fight as much, I mean, all of this kind of stuff. Glory's actually a legitimately good movie. Denzel Washington, a bunch of other famous black actors, I don't know that many actors. Matthew Broderick plays their uh, colonel, I think he's a colonel. Or lieutenant, um, sorry. Um, uh, I might have to get back to that person that he can leave a message. Um, I'll have to redo this. He's the boss. He gets to do that. Well, let's talk about, so let's continue this story about the military, right? Since just after World War II, being queer in the military was grounds for dishonorable discharge. That's bad, okay? No benefits after service. It goes on your military record like bad, okay? Dishonorable discharge means you did an action, frequently a crime, that brought dishonor not just to you individually, but to the entire branch of the military that you are enlisted in. That's a huge problem, right? This was the case until Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, which happened in, I think it was 91, uh, and this was Bill Clinton. So Bill Clinton had run basically on saying, uh, we know it would have been 91, it would have been 93 maybe. Bill Clinton had run on saying, look, one of the things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna allow queer people to serve openly in the military, right? And he got elected and then after the election, he said, I'm gonna do this, right? He says, I'm the boss, I get to do that, right? Uh, but, but, he got a lot of pushback from the Joint Chiefs of Staff who said, look, people don't want this. We're not ready for this. It's going to hurt morale, like this kind of thing. Which maybe is true. I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't in, I was in high school, not the military at the time. Okay. Um, and, but now he's kind of stuck. He's president. He has the right to say you're going to do it whether you like it or not. But if your parents ever said that to you, you know, it's like not the nicest thing to say. If you've ever had a boss say that to you, you know, it's it, 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 it doesn't make for happy workers, right? And so, you know, bosses have to kind of think about that. Like, am I, you know, how important is this to me? Am I really going to be that pushy and sort of make people do it? So he kind of hemmed and he hawed and he looked for a middle ground. And the middle ground he was able to come up with was called don't ask, don't tell. Okay. 
And it, the policy is what the policy says, right? Don't ask if someone's queer. And if someone asks you if you're queer, don't tell them. Don't ask, don't tell, right? Um, what do you kids say these days? Keep it on the down low, right? I believe that's what you got kids say these days. But queer rights progressed, okay? So time's moving on. You know, the 90s was a moment of increase in gay rights. Time's moving on. And um, states in the early 2000s or sort of late aughts, uh, states start allowing same-sex marriage. So you're starting to see further advancements of queer rights. And here's the problem. The problem is, is that if you can't tell someone that you're married, so you're in the military, you're gay, you married another man, you're, you're lesbian, you married another woman, you can't get benefits for that person because you're not allowed to put on a form that you're in a same-sex marriage. That would be telling somebody that would then be grounds for a discharge, okay? They can't even see you in the hospital if you're sick. If you die, they can't get death benefits. I mean, this is, you know, this is legit level like stuff, right? And people are married. So, you know, don't ask, don't tell is a compromised position in 93. Okay, I get it. But by 2010, um, it's really starting to run into some difficulties. Okay. Um, Obama gets elected. And what's interesting about the story here is the change that Obama did to um, allow gay persons to openly serve, queer persons to openly serve in the military wasn't just by executive order. It actually had statutory law behind it. In the reading, I kind of do a little bit more of a breakdown, okay? But there's a, a defense bill going through Congress. Democrats put in a procedure for a review process to determine if queer persons should be allowed to be in the military. This includes basically internal review by the Pentagon. Will there be any problems if we allow queer people to openly serve? Like, you know, will it, will it prevent uh, military preparedness? You know, how will it affect morale? Like this kind of stuff. But that's a legal change, the legislature, right? So they put into the law a process to um, investigate and then allow legally gay persons to be in the military. The law passes. Obama initiates the process with the Pentagon. The Pentagon comes back and says, it's fine. It's not going to affect our ability to fight a war. You know, we're okay with this. Obama then, according to the statutory law, fills out a little form, says, okay, I am now, according to the law passed by Congress, allowing gay persons to openly serve in the military. Now, what that means is it's not the power of executive order that actually certified uh, openly gay service. It's a, it's a statutory law passed by Congress. That statutory law says, according to this process, you can let gay people serve. You go through the process. That means to undo it, you can't really undo it is basically what it means. Okay. Um, because it's according to statutory law. So you'd have to go back through Congress and pass another law undoing what you had done, okay? Presidents can undo other presidents' executive orders. That's not terribly difficult. You just walk in and you say, I hereby decree that we're going to do opposite now, right? Um, and Trump's done a decent amount of, of that with some of Obama's stuff, okay? Um, but it does mean that this one can't just be undone based on the next president. However, the statutory law that was passed under Obama doesn't cover transgender or gender non-conforming persons, okay? So, um, uh, oh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, you're in a same-sex marriage, you're allowed to be open now. But that permitting process didn't cover, explicitly cover transgender persons um, or gender non-conforming persons and so when Trump came in, one of the first things he did actually was use an executive order to say transgender enlistment is no longer going to be allowed. They were allowing them to enlist, but the, the legal stuff here, everyone knew they didn't have as much protection and stuff like that. OK, so they had they were pre Trump. They were being allowed to enlist. Um, and it was, it was a dynamic situation. A lot of things, a lot of ins and outs, nitty gritty sort of changing here. Um, 
Uh, but with with Trump's transgender transgender ban, that means yes, if you're transgender in the military, you will be discharged. Okay, um, I should have said. Uh, well, he was kind of decommissioned because he left. He just left the service normally. I guess I should have said discharge. But I was giving this lecture in 2019, and a student had just come out of the Marines, and he goes, Professor Selby, like I actually saw this in real life. Right before the election, everyone thought Hillary Clinton was going to win. You know, Obama had done the the the, the same sex couple stuff, and we were on conference calls with admirals saying. Yeah, admirals, because Navy is, is uh, Marines are under the Navy with admirals saying, OK, listen, this is the protocol for dealing with transgender people. This is how we're going to treat them. You know, blah, 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 blah. This is what we expect. This is all going to happen soon. So they were already like doing training to set up uh, basically allowing transgender persons to openly serve and really sort of finalizing that process. As soon as Trump got elected, one of the it was very early on, he did this almost immediately. Um, no transgender persons in the military. And then what happened? Same admiral, completely different conversation two months later. Okay, listen, transgender people are no longer allowed to be in the military. And here's the protocol. If you know that someone's transgender, you're obligated to tell your superior officer and he's obligated to pass it all the way up the chain and we are going to remove them from service. Um, so, but that one could be, so if a democratic president gets elected, you would expect to kind of see, uh, 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 that probably become reversed. Um, DACA stands for deferred action for childhood arrivals. DACA was an Obama executive order because he was trying to get a comprehensive immigration law through Congress. He couldn't get that done. And so he, he, um, uh, he did what he could via executive order. Okay. Now remember, you're not allowed to, to go against statutory law. Okay. And you are supposed to enforce the laws. However, one of the things to keep in mind here is the power of enforcement also entails the power of not enforcement. Okay. And so, um, it's called discretion. You have discretion on how you're going to enforce the laws. Okay. Now let's do the legalese a little bit. DACA deferred action for childhood arrivals. You have to be, have been brought into the country as a child. No felonies or serious misdemeanors. No path to citizenship, which would clearly violate statutory law. Um, you have to apply and renew every two years. And deferred action pretty much just means we're not going to deport you and you can get kind of like a work permit and in many instances, in-state tuition, right? So in California, we give in-state tuition. Unlike the transgender ban, it's a bit harder for Trump just to undo this one, but he can and has nibbled and narrowed and restricted and defunded a lot of different pieces of it. This has gone to the courts. It went to the courts when Obama passed it. It went to the courts when, courts when Trump started trying to undo it okay um it's back in front of the supreme court again now one of the things that happens is people kind of throw a bunch of different legal arguments at the wall and hope that one of them will stick so um we've seen some of that with attempts to overturn daca other ones with attempts to overturn obamacare you like try one thing it doesn't work you try something else and you know third fourth try maybe it works um uh um so the courts so far have held that Trump is not allowed to just unilaterally completely shut down the program. A lot of the tinkerings and other things like that that he's done, the courts have held that 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 in fact is OK. Um, and let me give you an analogy for sort of, I think, the way the courts are thinking about this. Um, that's the next page. Oh, no. Let me give you an analogy. Oh, here we go back here. Let me give you an... Nope. There we go. Let me give you an analogy. Imagine that I was teaching this class, right? And I'd given out extra credit and you had already... I'm like, hey, here's an extra credit thing. You can do it whenever you want. You know, read some news and write a thing and tell me about it or something, right? So I give you some extra credit assignment. Okay, so there's the extra credit assignment. You did the extra credit assignment. So some of you have done the extra credit assignment. 
Then I get sick and I have to leave, right? So there's going to be a new boss, right? So there's a transition of power. And the new boss comes in and says, well, I'm the new boss. I don't believe in extra credit. And not only am I ending the program for any future extra credit, so you're not allowed to get extra credit in the future, but I'm taking away the extra credit to those who were awarded it by the old professor. And you would reasonably, if you had done that extra credit, feel like that was quite unfair. I know it's a different professor, but it's the same class, it's the same government, right? This program was put into place. Taking away a benefit that was given to me feels awfully arbitrary and unnecessary, right? Now, not continuing the program so that no new enrollees can get in or saying, okay, well, next semester when I teach this class, two years from now, you know, something like that, you're not going to be allowed to get extra credit. Like that all sort of would make sense. Okay. But taking away a benefit from somebody that's already been awarded to, uh, the courts have viewed as much more problematic. So that's kind of the a good analogy for thinking about how the courts have, uh, ruled on DACA. And, um, you know, sometimes students say like, Oh, Obama's giving away citizenship. Like that's clearly not what's happening. Okay. That's patently false. If anyone ever says that, just tell them that he's not allowed to do that. No one's allowed to do that. Citizenship, there's a citizenship process clause in the Constitution. And then statutory law has a lot to say about it. He is allowed to do things that don't violate statutory law and that don't violate constitutional law. And according to the court reviews that have come in so far, they've nibbled it, DACA. There's a couple of little things they took away, but they let it stand in, in, in the main whole of it. You know, we'll see how this new court rules because there's a couple new uh, conservative justices on there. And so, you know, like, there you go. Like, they could change their mind and start start undoing it. And, like, I wouldn't be terribly surprised if they did. Um, but the, the court also seems to be pretty favorable towards the power of the president. And so there's this kind of other question here of like, well, uh, are they going to... Um, you know, they, overall, they seem to be quite favorable to power of the president. So even if this is an instance they don't like as much in general, they seem pretty favorable. So what's going to happen with that? So that's an enforcement discretion question, right? And that kind of discretion, it feels like you're maybe playing a little bit fast and loose with the laws, but it's really not. It's within pretty normal operating procedure. OK, DACA is a big example. It pushes discretion maybe as far as it really can go or should go. Maybe it goes just too far. You know, I don't have like a big bone to pick here. Um, uh, but, um, you know, it feels to me like it's, it, you know, as it's titled deferred action, we're not not doing it. We're just not doing it right now. And that's fine. I mean, look, I have discretion in teaching this class. If I judge that things need to change for some reason, we just change them, right? Um, or especially if you have an exception, you know, you're like, oh, my dog died and like this and that and everything. And can I do something late or whatever? Might not fit exactly the rules, but I have discretion to suspend the rules, to not enforce the rules if I so choose. But it does feel like certain constitutional rights should not be subject to discretion, right? And in some instances, as a matter of fact, they kind of are. Um, and so uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, by the power of executive order, created the legal structure that allowed for Japanese internment all up and down the West Coast, um, including they're actually ex any Japanese in Alaska were just expelled. They were taken out of the state. Um, uh, many in California, interesting Japanese in Hawaii, this did not apply to them. Um, so just keep that in mind. About half of the Japanese in internment camps were citizens. That means they're put in internment camps via the power of executive order and without a trial. That is clearly unconstitutional. Okay. But in times of war, presidents are given extra leeway known as emergency power or war powers to get things done. So, you know, war power, specifically war emergency power is a little bit broader. There's a small distinction here, but they're really coming from the same source, which is what we would call 
uh, necessity, okay? The Supreme Court itself upheld internment. Um, there's a few cases here, but the big one is Korematsu v. U.S. in 1942. And basically the court just said, look, uh, it's a time of war, and the interest of war is more important than the interest of citizenship rights right now. So I know you think you have rights and that they're supposed to count, but we're at war, so too bad they don't. Okay. Um, and so, you know, concerns about espionage. Um, and, you know, I, I, if I was there, I don't know, I might have made this ruling. I don't know. Um, it doesn't live super well in history. Um, but, um, you know, the Supreme Court telling a sitting president during right after a big attack that you're not allowed to do something. That's a tough position for the court to be in. Right. Um, so but what's happening here? What's happening here is we're showing how in certain cases the Constitution itself can just be basically suspended. Like discretion is, well, I'm going to enforce things a little bit here and there and you know, I have some leeway, okay? But emergency powers basically are the Constitution right now just doesn't count and the president's going to be allowed to do whatever he wants to do, okay? This is what some scholars call the necessity rights circle. Because we're like, oh, it's America, you have rights, you have rights, you have rights. Yay, Constitution. And then, oh, attack. Well, we're taking away your rights right now. And maybe we'll give them back to you later, right? And then we're like, oh, no, but you should have rights. Well, but we're taking them away. So you're stuck in this circle of you have rights. We take them away for necessity. We reassert the importance of rights. Necessity comes back. We take them away. And you're just stuck going round and round and round in this necessity rights circle, okay? This is a real criticism of all forms of constitutionalism, okay? and basically rights-based approaches to thinking about politics. Um, um, and think about the show 24, right? Which came out, again, right after a different spectacular attack on the United States. People really felt that sense of emergency. We have the war on terror. Who knows, it's never officially declared war, but we call it the war on terror. And then the president starts expanding his rights and the Supreme Court recognizes the necessity of giving the president extra leeway at this point. I mean, you know, war always creates this impetus for executives to try to push their power and to rule and govern more themselves rather than talking to the truly representative branches of government, right? And it's like, you know, terrorists, there's going to be a bomb. We got 24 hours, right? That's the whole thing on the show. We got 24 hours and then you know, you torture them and you break their, you know, you search them illegally and all that. And it's like, well, it's justified out of necessity. Um, uh, a current version of Japanese internment where we see the same necessity at work is on, is in Guantanamo Bay where we have put, uh, um, accused but untried terrorists. Now, Maybe a few of them are innocent. It's almost certain that they're all guilty of something. Um, but like, that's not exactly the point. Like, we don't have a declared war. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, they're being held basically in violation of U.S. domestic law and in violation of all international law. But it doesn't matter because Guantanamo Bay is technically part of Cuba, but it's occupied by the United States. That means domestic law doesn't apply there. That means Cuban law doesn't apply there. That means international law doesn't apply there. The only law that applies is the law of military power. Okay. So you throw people there in Guantanamo Bay and, you know, basically we're just going to keep them there until they all get sick and die in 20 years. I mean, that's literally uh basically what's going that's the end game here or you bring them to america and you try them but that's difficult and you know the evidence isn't as good as we would like that's why they're in guantanamo bay if we had a bunch of silver bullets and smoking guns it would be a little bit of a different story um and literally the president is all powerful in guantanamo bay he can walk in there and direct almost anything to happen within that narrow sphere of guantanamo bay Okay, that's 
war powers. That's emergency powers. Um, and war powers or emergency powers are also from the kingly origins of the presidency. Okay. Um, and kings, one of the things kings did to increase their power through the late Middle Ages was they, they started wars exactly so that they could use war and emergency powers to bring more power and ability to themselves. We called that the process of state building. So kings would start wars and then increase taxes and have the government do more and more regulations and more into people's lives and stuff like that. So we're seeing a very sort of similar process continuing to play itself out now. It's possible that the combination of the growth of federal power, um, especially surveillance power through things like the Patriot Act and other positive laws, um, are a genuine threat to the democratic republican future of our government and our constitutional order of checks and balances. This is completely outside of that constitutional order of checks and balances and the word suspend is a nice way to think about it, but you could think even worse about it and just say completely ignore, right? But what good are rights if you can suspend them whenever necessity happens? Like the whole point about rights is they need to be operative all the time, not just the easy times. If you only have rights when it's easy, you don't really have rights at all, right? This is a concern. People should have this concern, okay? Um, I'm not, I don't go as far as some, so, you know, let's be clear, okay? But I understand where people like this are coming from. Um, and some scholars argue that there's a fundamental tension in the United States Constitution between the legislative and executive branches and that the founders unintentionally created a, it might be an elective king, but they unintentionally created an actual king and that he's slowly winning in this fight between king and parliament, which we saw in England. That's kind of part of the whole history of many of the things we've covered, right? Wow, that's profound, okay? Um, now we've also seen, so I talked about the Patriot Act, I'm just going to hit some of the highlights of the growth of emergency powers under new federalism and the war on terror. So remember, new federalism had two basic prongs. One was devolving more things to the states. So it had a kind of states rights push. But then two, it also kind of like old school cooperative federalism. It had um, it had um, uh, uh, more the increase of, of state surveillance and military power, right? And so, you know, this is this side here is the side of the, the increased continuing centralization of war and military power by the federal government and the increasing size. I mean, we got a big war machine, right? I mean, that's what it is. Um, so the Patriot Act authorizes certain types of warrantless searches, which are justified under emergency powers. You still have to go through a FISA court, but you don't get a traditional warrant, meaning the burden of proof is a lot lower. And what we do know about these searches is they were meant to be few and far between, but they're not really. Once you create a loophole, you just start putting everything through the loophole, right? Well, it could happen. It could happen. It could happen. I'm not saying that's wrong but it's not the constitution, okay? Um, we had the torture memos. So the torture memos were written um, by a lawyer working for Bush's White, White House who redefined torture as enhanced interrogation techniques. And sometimes in the law, all you need to do is call something something else. So i.e. waterboarding. Waterboarding is recognized by American law and international law as torture, but you redefine it via executive order as enhanced interrogation techniques. That's very clearly a violation in my judgment. Obama overturned the torture memos. It was one of the first things he did. It's an executive, it's effectively in the same box as executive order. And he said, nope, we're not doing this anymore. He passed an actual executive order saying we're not doing this anymore. But like it, once the, the box of necessity is open, it's really hard to put that, that Pandora back in the box, right? And um, Obama has used the same logic in many of his other approaches, such as the use of drones and uh, killing foreign combatants or even American citizens who were foreign combatants. Look, according to the Constitution, 
All citizens are supposed to have a trial before they're punished. You're not supposed to effectively just execute citizens, right? Um, you know, he was not, you know, we killed this guy. He wasn't there shooting at an American soldier. That would be a different story. That would be like a police officer in self-defense. That's allowed, right? But unless someone is an active threat, just joining an extremist group isn't supposed to be warrant for execution, but he clearly was executed. So, you know, there you go. Um, there's many, 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 many more examples we could go here, but um, a little more recent one to bring it forward to Trump. Uh, Trump's Muslim travel ban was justified on exactly the same uh, logic as warrantless searches, torture memos, Obama's execution. Um, basically some notion of emergency. These people are dangerous. We're going to have a special set of rules that's going to apply to them. Okay. Now the travel ban was uh, looked at the courts and overturned in its first like three or four iterations, but Trump kept kind of tinkering with it. And then finally they let a decent amount of it stand. Um, I'm not trying to prejudice you too much against war powers and emergency powers, but the truth of the matter is one of the most powerful political scientists to have studied this is an actual literal Nazi by the name of Carl Schmitt. And uh, Carl Schmitt, um, uh, you know, he actually, artic he, he had been a sci political scientist for a while, but through the 1920s, German society was basically collapsing. He became radicalized. He was already pretty far to the right, but he became radicalized, like ultra conservative. Um, and he was actually part of the, uh, I don't know if conspiracy is the right technical term, but part of the group of people who helped lead to the overthrow of the Weimar Republic, which was a democracy. It wasn't functioning super great, but it was a democracy. And a lot of Carl Schmitt's ideas are exactly designed to defend the legitimacy of authoritarianism vis-a-vis -vis the illegitimacy of democracy and rights. He did not believe in individual rights at all. Okay. Um, and he, he, he wrote books saying we should have an authoritarian, we should have a king or some other kind of authoritarian leader. He wrote books saying that all based upon this idea of necessity. Okay. There's one person there who's going to decide what necessity is and when it's happening. We're going to call that person the sovereign. Um, he decides when necessity is happening. That's the locus of political power. So we need a Hitler to decide this for us or some other strong man dictator. He calls that idea the state of exception, that there's a person there who has the right to decide when laws are going to be suspended and just power is then going to step in and, 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 and um, be the deciding force. Okay. Um, uh, you know, um, these are dangerous ideas. There's no doubt about it. It's not that that doesn't mean Schmidt is wrong. Schmidt thinks of himself as an empiricist. He thinks of himself as making factual claims. Um, I do think that factually speaking, there's, he's maybe not wrong. I don't think he's entirely right either. Um, uh, but basically in, in Carl Schmidt's eyes, Constitutions are only a piece of paper and you only have rights because no one has decided to take them away from you today. So get over it. He was, like I said, he was an open, open defender of authoritarianism. He thought liberal notions of individual rights were actually causing political life in, and here liberal meaning philosophical liberalism. So this, like the founding fathers were all philosophic, largely philosophically liberal. Um, uh, and he thought these notions of rights and human rights and natural rights and social contract and all of that, these are all things that were in the American constitution. He thinks that's all a whole bunch of baloney and, um, uh, he openly says so. And he thinks that it actually leads to less good politics than if we're just more honest and say it's all about power. Um, but like, here's the problem. Um, in authoritarian regimes, they're, they're strongly prone to jailing citizens for speaking out, murder, reduction of human rights, death squads, you know, you name it, you name the bad thing, authoritarian regimes on every level are more likely to do it 
and they lead to a lot of death and harm and suffering. And, you know, uh, you know, I just can't lie to you about that. Like being a journalist in Russia is incredibly dangerous. Putin just executes people domestically who are doing their jobs, right? That's, that's not okay. Um, uh, and you know, it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican, this way of thinking leads to dangerous consequences, right? As I showed you, um, there's been both Democratic and Republican presidents that have embraced this way of thinking, FDR and Obama, Trump and Bush, like it's once you're a president there and you have this tool, it's really hard to self-regulate and just say, I'm not going to use it because the if you don't use it and something bad happens, you're going to be on the hook, right? Um, uh, and, you know, according to Carl Schmitt, the whole world is Guantanamo Bay. We just fool ourselves into thinking that we actually have rights. When push comes to shove, we're all living in Guantanamo Bay, which is a little scary way of thinking, right? Like, oh, wow. Fundamentally, it's just power is all that matters, right? Guns is the number one thing. That's the only thing that matters. Oof. Um, now, um, it's not to say that, that Carl Schmidt is right, but one of the things he is bringing up that's really important for us to think about is that constitutions don't automatically self-enforce. They don't enforce themselves. As I showed you, the Supreme Court sometimes has been, has openly flouted the constitution. They're not perfect. Okay. They're humans. Um, and in fact, Carl Schmidt would have some really interesting things to say about the American Supreme Court, but you know, there you go. And exceptions to the constitution have been and are recognized by the Supreme Court itself. Um, if you personally think this is a problem, I get nervous. Um, I'm not sure it's as big of a problem as some of the people say, but I understand where they're coming from. The only way to hold government accountable is to hold government accountable. In a democracy, it's the civic duty of each citizen to do that. So if you're upset by this, you should think about voting in ways that are going, you know, for candidates that say they're going to restrain the security state, we could call it the security state, um, and, um, uh, and or join groups like ACLU, others that are trying to bring legal challenges and have political platforms to go against to go against this okay so um uh that's the that's the end of this lecture i'll upload it and get it up online uh soon all right guys take care